Welcome to the Real Chili Podcast. And the Golden Eagles of Marquette University in Milwaukee are bound for the Final Four for only the third time ever. Five seconds left. Marquette down by one. Trying to avoid the upset. Blew the drive. The left hand. It's good. Every day, as basketball players, as students, and I want to win every day, most importantly, as people. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Real Chili Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lavender. I'm joined by Brian Henry and Pete Worth, and we are here today to talk about Marquette's 86-71 loss to the Purdue University Boilermakers. Brian, neighbor, how you doing? How you handling the loss so far? Mike, it's not Purdue. It's per did. And oh, the Boilermakers. Uh, woe is Marquette on this evening. But as we'll get into, not as bad as, uh, as it felt in the moment. We came into this game knowing that Purdue was going to be able to bring a lot of height, two seven-footers. We knew that Marquette was going to have to have a stellar performance from the three-point line. And I think both of those things turned out to be true. But what this game reinforced for me is that Purdue is a legitimately good team that is looking, at least at this early stage, um, like they could be a top four, top three seed in the tournament and certainly could be in contention to win the Big Ten. And I think given that factor, Marquette fought admirably, but we just don't have the horses to play down low with them at this point in the season. I think the biggest key in this game was obviously Isaac Haas. And about the middle of the second half, I got one of my favorite things in the world, and that's a mid-Marquette game Brian Henry phone call. Yeah. Talk. Oh, it was a good, it was a good one. <laughs> oh, I, I missed the first call, and I instantly called him back within about you know 30 seconds. So, uh, Pete, Pete, tell the people what we talked about. Tell the people what we talked about. Steve Wojciechowski was, was faced with a critical decision on how to guard Hodge. He was. Obviously, we don't have the matchups. So do we double team, or do we play him straight up? and let their shooters beat us. He decided in the first half that we were going to play straight up against Haas. And and Stephen Bardo, midway through the first half, I think, noticed this, that all of Marquette's perimeter players were staying out on the perimeter and guarding their three-point shooters and letting Haas basically go one-on-one every time. And Wojo was relying on Helt to at least play adequate defense. We knew he was going to give up some baskets. Like Brian and I talked about, we were just hoping that he wasn't going to score every time. And for the most part... For the most part, he did. Especially in the second half, he did. What was interesting was his willingness, although I think a couple possessions late, when he shook it up and put Hauser on Haas, and all of a sudden the game picked up its pace a little bit. We got out in transition, hit some threes. That's how they made their run at the end of the first half. And it's also how they made their run around the... 12, 13 minute mark of the second half when they came back and cut it to about three or four. So there were positive moments defensively, but Pete's right. And I know Mike, you made the point, don't have the horses to play with Purdue. We didn't have any horses to play with, to play with Purdue down on the block. God bless Matt Helt. We're not going to bury him and make every joke in the world. God knows the kid did his best, but he completely outclassed. And that's not his fault. Matt Helt is in, in a perfect world a probably 12 to 15 minute a game energy guy. And I think he could, which is impressive that he's gotten himself to that. Mm -hmm. And it's a, that's a tough sit. He was in a tough spot tonight. Yep. I think absolutely there's a scenario. We hit more shots and that game's more competitive, but that was about what you could hope for. It was a tight game with 10 minutes left and Purdue's best Purdue proved they were just a better overall team at this point of the season. True helter skelter will have to be seen another day. Is basically what. And we will we will no doubt see it later in the season. So Isaac Haas fin- finished with twenty two points. He was eight of fourteen from the field, six of six from the line. Just devastating when you can have a seven footer who can put up that percentage from the field and go perfect from the line. I mean that that is a. I'm jealous of that. He he had uh, he finished with just five rebounds, but it did seem, given the fact that Purdue had two seven footers, Marquette struggled all night on the boards, yeah, which is yep. not a shocking factor, but uh, kind of played out like we thought it would. You know, to get to to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about how Wojo decided to play Haas, it was pick your poison. I think you saw uh, Sakar, you saw Hauser kind of come in on a double team more frequently in the second half. There were a couple situations when it worked. But in the second half, what happened is that all good teams adjust. Good teams adjust. And Purdue, and Purdue, Purdue started 
0 and 7 from three. And then they, at one point, were 4-4 four and four after that. So when we started that double team, uh, Haas clearly was able to move the ball around, and they were able to get ball movement and hit wide open threes. And to Pete's point, that's the exact reason why they didn't come out doing that in the first half. He didn't right. want to get the ball right. moving and didn't want to get their shooters involved early. And I I mean, it's weird to say Marquette tried to turn the game into a grounded-out slog because that's obviously not what our – you know. When Marquette was winning a year ago, which I think we would say is the best season so far in the Wojo area, it was high volume, lots of shots up and down the floor, dig defensively and turn it into a track meet. The more shots we get, the better off we are with the shooters that we have. That was the opposite of what they tried to do tonight, which is interesting because that, I mean, that's obviously it's not our bread and butter, but against that roster, and that's a team you could run into in an NCAA tournament, yeah. they had to try to find a way to do it. Now, who knows, in March, maybe we're better equipped Dude. with Froling out there. I don't think it's that drastically different if he's on the floor uh, tonight because he. But do, do you think they in t- that w- that Wojo intended to slow the game down like that? Because when I watched the length of the Purdue defenders, the height, the size, I mean, they were smothering. We were we couldn't get you know. Yep. It was difficult to penetrate inside the three point line. I thought I thought Purdue slowed yeah. the game down yeah. by focusing offensively by getting the ball into Haas and Painter did a great job of drawing up sets, doing early screens to get Haas open down on the block. And let's face it. I mean, they had no trouble with the entry pass into Haas all night long. And, and that's a big part of it. That also was a demonstration of our lack of size on the perimeter, which is going to be there yep. all year. Andrew Rousey, right. God love him. We're going to say a lot of positive things about him in a second. Same with Marcus. We're going to say a lot of positive things but long arms and it's not what they're bringing to the table defensively. And so they're got the guys they're guarding are going to be able to enter the ball in freely. It's just something you got to deal with right now. Purdue got contributions up and down, up and down that roster, yeah. including uh, that, that guy Eifert who looks like Kevin, the bird from the movie up. Oh, great uh, call. He, he does eight points. And basically what he got his points from just us in the second half, double teaming Haas. And he was just standing, you know, underneath the, underneath the basket wide open for layups and, and ones. And then uh, Klein coming off the bench hitting a couple big threes. And then Math- Matthias kind of got going in the second half too. So it was kind of what I was fearing going into this game. And the more I thought about it today, like this morning, I just thought they were too well-rounded because I, I mentioned Vince Edwards being the guy that we need to be most f- afraid of going into the game uh, on our pod on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And he was basically a non-factor uh, early in the game. He made a couple buckets in the second half as well. And he was he was good on the boards as well, eight rebounds. But, I mean, for the most part, it was all Haas. But there were positives, Mike. I mean, there were a lot of positives in that oh, game. Oh, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about kind of the big overarching themes and how this game played out. Uh, Marquette made some nice runs, but really over the course of the game just couldn't hang with Purdue's size and with Purdue's athleticism and inexperience. I think you saw moments where Elliott got in, and Elliott actually did a couple of nice things. Helt did some nice things, but you, and Theo John did some good things. He also did some freshman things, as you would expect. So there were some positives. Uh, let's, and, let's, and, and Hanif Cheatham got the ball stuffed out, shoved down his throat about <laughs> four different times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, he he will be in a long list of people who have had that issue with Purdue this season. No, I know, but he had a couple just violent ones put back down. God love him. See, kept attacking the rim, but oh, baby. Yeah, those were blocked at a zero-degree angle straight into the ground on, <laughs> like, every, basically was, 100% of his blocks. I mean, getting your shot blocked sucks, but there's something deflating when it, like, gets thrown back to the floor. Yeah. It's just, with like like a volleyball. I, I don't know. Anyway, continue, Mike. So I think if we're looking at Marquette's offensive performance, you know, I think we struggled to move the ball as well as we wanted to because of the size of some of our guards out on the perimeter, because of Purdue's smothering defense. We shot the ball from three-point pretty well. We shot 40%. So we had a decent three-point performance from Andrew Rousey, four of nine, uh, Marcus Howard, four of eight. And they were really the ones who could carry it, you know, who we needed to carry us through this game, but it just wasn't quite enough, and they weren't able to put it con- together consistently because of Purdue smothering. And I and I and I think the point that I want to make here is that we need three point shooting in a game like this to carry us because we can't win one on one matchups offensively. There was no one on the Marquette roster who could take anyone from Purdue one on one and beat them. Hauser couldn't do it. Cheatham couldn't do it. Howard and Rousey maybe, but because of their size, they couldn't do it. And so we hang had to on, get. Hang on, hang on. I- I'm just saying I disagree that got I mean I thought in that second half Howard and Rousey both did incredible jobs one on one to get their shout off. 
whether it was going to the basket or pulling up off screens or um, catching off the dribble. I thought they did excellent jobs doing that. And to your point, I mean, they finished with 25 and 24 points respectively. Yeah. I don't think they could have done much more. That was as well – that was as strong an offensive performance as we're going to see all year from those two. And they hit some tough freaking shots with guys up in their shit the entire freaking night. That was the thing in the first half. I mean, Purdue's – uh, perimeter defense was swarming, and they weren't weren't giving up any easy shots. We got some open, more open looks in the second half when we were kind of drive doing a little more drive and kick. But f- still, for the most part, it was kind of one on one, beat your man off the dribble, and try to free yourself up for a shot between Marcus Howard and, and Andrew Rousey, and that's hard to live by, you know. Because especially, I'm just gonna say, I think it's amazing that the score was as close. What looking at the how diff how well Purdue played defensively, I'm amazed it was only a 15 point yeah, game. Yeah, and it. Uh, you, you take a couple of those away, that's a 20 plus point loss easy. Well, and we have we had we scored 61 points between Rousey, Hauser and Howard, 10 from the rest of the roster. Right. And that's not going to cut it. And, not and, good and enough. Matt Helt, yeah, and Matt Helt we've already described his deficiencies, but zero points, one rebound, two assists, five fouls in uh in however many minutes he played. I mean, that's not going to cut it for a starting center and he's basically no right, threat offensively. Right. I mean, you could tell uh when one of Marcus Howard's turnovers, um I think it was in the first half, he was cut down to the lane and tried to pass. He saw Matt Helt standing there, but he just he was like, oh, "I'm not going to throw it to him, so I'm going to chuck it back into yep. the uh it, like back into the top of the top Turned of the paint over. and uh yeah. it didn't work out so well. It was turnover. Here. Mike, let me throw this at you cuz I think I think it was apparent Pete kind of started to alluding to it. All right, Helt really was a non-factor offensively. John was a non-factor. John was really not a threat unless he was catching and attempting to dunk or lay the ball in. Elliott, I don't think, was able to play in that game to get his shot off. And through two games, God loves Sakar. I do love the effort, and I think there's a place for him to play. But he does not have a whole lot of touch when he squares up to shoot the ball. We played eight guys tonight, and four of them, I think, were incapable of scoring that's exactly my point like we have these two guys rousey and howard and hauser can supplement at times rousey finished with 25 howard with 24 and we still lost by the what we still lost by 15 so part of that is produced legitimate but we don't have i mean hauser is a third scoring threat but because rousey and howard create their shots with ridiculous amounts of dribbling and tremendous handles um i mean that's that's how they do it i i i I don't know. I, th- I think I don't think we're going to face the same challenge against many other teams because Purdue is so so unique. Uh, but it certainly was a struggle. With the few minutes we have left here, we need to talk about defense uh, because defense was one of was not one of it was the problem for this team last year. And I got sick of talking about it by the end of last year because it was such a frequent problem. I thought I saw signs. Of defensive, it wasn't as much a problem as that we just didn't do it, which was a problem. <laughs> which was a problem. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now you're getting yeah. a little too existential for us, Brian. That's all that peyote out in Arizona. Lots. Brian's in his sweat lodge doing this podcast. <laughs> it felt like our defense was better tonight. I think part of that was because of the presence of Theo John. I, I mean, it wasn't perfect. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I think the sc- the score shows that, but it does feel like our defense against a quality opponent put up a decent showing. I thought Sam Hauser was our MVP defensively. If you you watched him carefully throughout the whole game, he was moving his feet really well and played the pick and roll tremendously Mm. and, and hedging on screens and getting back and rotating on defense and getting in position for a rebound. I thought he played a great game on defense. Pete, he did an admirable job against Haas. The handful of possessions he went up against him, forced him to travel, forced him to throw the ball away. Granted, I think that was a, uh, I thought that was a showing that Haas is not the greatest decision maker. And it will be telling all of us here. We'll watch a decent amount of big 10 basketball. I think against bigger, more capable centers, He's not. There's no way he's going to be that dominant. He's not that quick mm. against a larger, more athletic center, which that conference has plenty of. I, th- I he'll have a nice season, but I don't think he's going to be. You know, he's not Shaquille O'Neal at LSU dominant. You know, he's he's good, but he's not going to be that. He's more like the Sean Bradley Monstar, is what you're saying. Yeah, Sean Bradley was a first. That kid's not getting drafted in the first round. No, the, the Sean Brad, the Sean Bradley monster. Oh yeah, probably like the Sean Bradley. Not monster. Sean Bradley. A quick question for you too, Theo John. 
has some he he has defensive potential. Clearly, with the foul issues, he fouled out again in this game with just three points. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Yeah, but is it it's it's a problem that can be fixed, right? This this is not a he's gonna have to guard he's gonna have to guard guys bigger than him all season though. He's only what six. But eight, the point is, we're he, he we're talking about so if we're talking about Theo and we're saying he can be taught not to do the things that he's doing right now. You can't teach his size, so I think. Right, I mean that's the way I'm looking at it. Right, it may it may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen against VCU. Luke Fisher begs to differ to that. <laughs> to that boy, <laughs> jeez. Agree with you, Mike. Yes, he's a freshman in his second game. Yes, can he get smarter and not foul? I don't think it's a can't. He has to. Mm-hmm. He's got to be able to play 15 plus, 20 plus minutes a game at times. And if he's just sitting there, you know, mashing guys with his hips every time they catch the ball down below. He's going to get called for a blocking foul. I mean, the referees did it again tonight. I think they were they were a little ticky tack both ways. Yeah. Uh, tonight on some of the calls, and Bar- and Bardo talked about that during the game about you know you gotta you know there's got to be a little more. Fit. I understand they want people to be able to move, but there still has to be some discretion when you've got guys that are six ten and two hundred and seventy pounds, you know, mashing each other to give them a little bit of leeway. Yeah, it, he can't foul like that, and it, some of them were bad fouls. Yeah. They had some bad fouls the opening game against Mount St. Mary's. Yeah, reach-ins and over-the-backs. I, I don't think there was any over-the-backs, but I think there was a couple of reach-ins and then a couple in transition, a couple of, uh, of defensive rebounds for Purdue when they were outletting the ball and him kind of reaching in on those passes. It's, it's those sorts of things that he's got to eliminate from his game. I'm okay with over-the-back fouls. I, I, honestly, God, those I can live with, with him attacking the rim to rebound the ball. It's everything else that's ticky-tack below the rim. And on screens, too, and a lot of that is the, Agreed, the guards yes. waiting for him to come over, and so they have to work, work that out. I know we're wrapping it, Mike, but we are we have been a lousy screening team through the first two games, and that's something we can continue to watch because we that's something we have not – Helt and Theo both have not done well screening uh, for guards. You know, that's a carryover from last year. We weren't a great screening team last year. So – Wrapping up here in the, in the final couple of minutes we have, I want to throw it to each of you for final thoughts. So looking forward, our next game is the first game of the Maui Invitational where we play VCU in Maui on November 20th. So not necessarily talking about predictions for that game, but when you're talking about getting the team from this game to the next game, what are things that you're looking for to see them improve on? Or what are your takeaways from this game about how Marquette moves forward from here? Uh, Brian Henry, I'm going to throw it to you first. Um, Something we didn't talk about and something I'm going to watch closely the next time they get on the floor is Sam Hauser not getting run off the line as effectively as he was tonight against Purdue. He did still finish with 12 points and made a contribution, but they did an every time Sam caught the ball in the perimeter, he went backwards. His step was backwards on his pivot, and he had, an, had, a, he had a habit of putting the ball on the floor and going away from the basket. Uh, that is going to jump off for a team like VCU, uh, especially even without Shaka Smart. They're still pressing, they're still up in people's shorts for the majority of a game. They're going to go after Sam. They're going to look at Sam Hauer, Hauser as a passive type player, and they'll make it try and make it difficult for him again. That'll be a big thing that I'll watch. Big picture, it's a tough one. It's always tough to lose. This we said it. This isn't a team we match up with well at this point of the season. I think in March could be a different story as this team gets better. And obviously, you add a seven footer and Harry Froling. Nothing to lose your. They lost to a better team tonight. You would have wished it was a little bit closer, but after watching what we watched, I think that's about what the score should have been. Neighbor? No, let's face it. Nobody nobody expected us out, outside of our esteemed and, and somewhat crazy uh, colleague, Peter Mohan. Nobody expected us to win this game tonight. Esteemed, interesting <laughs> choice of words. Yeah, and uh, the first half, especially, I thought our defense was much improved We because we were actually playing D. We were tough in Purdue's guard's face. And our, the rotation was much better. I was very happy that we were able to stick with them for the majority of that game. And a lot of it had to do with our defense because we weren't hitting shots in the first half and they were making life difficult for us all night, and especially our shooters. Actually, I would say I'm pleased with, with the performance and the ability, despite you know being so undersized, that our defense held tough. The one thing I would have to say, I'm disappointed in Hanif Cheatham. You know, it's his, it's his junior year. Yeah. He had a down year this uh, last year. I was hoping that he could definitely improve against top competition. Two for nine tonight, five points, one rebound, no assists, no steals, no blocks. Oof. He's not contributing much when he's out there. What I want to see from him is hard cuts to the lane because our guards, Rousey and Howard, when they are uh, dribble attacking, 
Um, there's there's space for Cheatham to get in the lane and to make cuts to get to the basket. Now let's hope he doesn't get stuffed every time. But I, I saw him a lot of times just kind of drifting, and that's something he needs to work on. So there you have it, folks. I think there's some positives and negatives in there. I want to say thank you, a personal thank you from each of us to all the new listeners we've had. We've had a tremendous rise in listenership uh, just over the past month. And so thank you and hello. Thank you. To all of our new listeners. We're so glad you're with us. We think it's going to be a fun season. This was a tough game uh, against a quality opponent, but we think there are bright things ahead as this team grows up and and, and comes together over the course of the next few weeks. So we'll be coming at you soon uh, with a breakdown of the schedule, with a breakdown and look ahead to the VCU game in the Maui Invitational. Plenty of content coming at you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Real Chili Podcast, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, that was an elite podcast, people. Elite. <laughs> God, neighbor, have you ever you ever wrapped it up before? Jeez, holy <laughs> shit! Oh my god! I know you're you gotta a lot cut of it. Times. Sometimes you gotta cut it, like.